from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, winner of the Southern Oregon Television Award for Program of the Year and the Award for Best Educational Program. I'm the host and producer, John Letts. Ramping Up Your English is an educational support program for intermediate English learners. It's a program for people from all language backgrounds. Ramping Up Your English is also for people of all ages. Now, if you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and want to reach higher levels of proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is Animals. This is segment one of episode 52. In episode 51, we looked at the habitats of three North American mammals. The habitats are the types of areas that support the needs of a given animal. In this episode, we're also going to explore the meaning of biomes. Now, just as an animal's range and its habitat are often related, the habitat of an animal has a lot to do with the biome in which the animal is found. Let's start with a review of habitat. A habitat is an area that provides for the needs of an animal. Those needs are food, water, shelter, and space. Now, you may remember in previous episodes, we shared how pet owners, farmers, and those who care for animals need to provide for their needs that the animals can no longer get from their natural environment. The form of meeting those needs change when the animal is domesticated, but the needs don't change. Now, wild animals need to live in places that have the means for them to meet their own needs for food, water, space, and shelter. One uh, fantastic wild animal in North America is the bighorn sheep. Now, it's not a very adaptable animal, as a result, it lives in a fairly limited range. Bighorn sheep live in two basic habitats, craggy mountains and deserts. We'll take a close look at both of those kinds of habitats, but first, let's learn more about bighorn sheep. Overlooking the Snake River, this bighorn sheep occupies the habitat where it thrives. Bighorn sheep are creatures of the mountains they're agile on the rocky terrain near Hell's Canyon on the border between Oregon and Idaho. Bighorn sheep are native here, as well as the Rocky Mountains and the high country of California, Arizona, Nevada, and into Mexico's Baja California. This is a group of females, ewes, and one lamb. During the early summer months, they graze on plants at the edge of the river. They are safe from land-based predators here. Their ability to easily move among the craggy terrain and loose rocks gives them an advantage in escaping predators. Their sharp hooves are shaped in a way that allows them to grip the rocky ground, allowing easy movement. Most of the year, the males, the rams, live in small groups, allowing the ewes and their lambs to have the best feeding grounds. As for the rams, like this one feeding on a bush, they face a future of butting heads with each other, an example of fighting for the right to reproduce. In mid-June, travelers on the wild portion of the Snake River are rewarded with views of bighorn sheep on the rocky banks of the river. After being overhunted in the 19th century, bighorn sheep are protected today. They continue to grace the mountain country along the Snake River. You're watching Ramping Up Your English on RVTV Voices. The bighorn sheep you just saw live in a roadless area in Hell's Canyon, the deepest canyon in the United States. It's one of the roughest terrains to cross unless you travel by boat in the Snake River. I shot the video from a jet boat in the river and felt plenty of excitement to see these magnificent animals so close up. Now, while I videotaped a young ram, there was no mature rams in our view. 
Now this cover of the wildlife card shows two mature rams, and you can see why this species has the common name of bighorn sheep. It refers to the horns on the mature rams, horns that can weigh more than all their bones put together. They use these horns for one purpose, to fight with each other for the right to reproduce during the rut when the ewes are receptive. The rut occurs during the fall and it's said that Hell's Canyon echoes with the sound of these animals ramming their heads into each other. This map on the wildlife card shows the area of North America where they live, their range. Besides the steep, craggy mountains of eastern Oregon and western Idaho, they also live in the deserts of California, Nevada, Arizona, and northern Mexico. As mentioned in the video, their physical adaptations provide them with protection from predators and access to plants, which other animals would struggle to get. Inside the wildlife card, we learn about the habitat of bighorn sheep. During the summer, they live at altitudes ranging from 6,000 to 8,000 feet in the mountain terrain. In the winter, they descend to 5,000 feet to avoid deep snow, but they still favor the steep, rocky terrain. Now, Hell's Canyon is the perfect place for them to range. Each small herd moves about a, in a range of about 20 square miles, so they require a lot of space. They require a great amount of vegetation to eat, and this type of country has sparse vegetation. So after taking notes from this section on habitats, we can summarize the bighorn habitat by writing bighorn sheep populate craggy mountain terrain between 5,000 and 8,000 feet of elevation. There they find their food in mountain meadows and grassy slopes. The steep craggy slopes provide shelter from predators and their low elevation range allows them to escape from the cold weather in the winter and the heavy snow that covers the vegetation. Some populations occupy rocky regions of desert, that being desert habitats. So we've used the facts from the wildlife card by taking notes, but then we've used our own connecting words, shown in all caps, to achieve the language function of describing a habitat. You may want to separately copy the connecting language from the wildlife cards, but that would be to use it in a, a future description. But you don't want to copy the wording from the wildlife card in your current description. It's best to put your own words to paper to communicate the habitat description in your report using connecting phrases to bring out the facts. Now, when you think about the descriptions we've done in earlier episodes, you may realize that describing a habitat is very similar to describing a simpler object. You still describe the habitat by listing its parts and by modifying nouns with adjectives. We use the words steep and grassy to describe the slopes where bighorn sheep find their food. As mentioned earlier, some populations of bighorn sheep, actually a subspecies, live in the deserts of the American Southwest. A desert habitat is, by definition, short on water, and plants are not abundant either. Now, some deserts are hot during the day, actually most of them, and cold at night. It's interesting that bighorn sheep can live in such a different habitat, but we know that they do. They have similar physical adaptations, but their behavior adaptations are likely to be very different. We'll revisit bighorn sheep when we cover adaptation segments of our animal reports. Now, I want to show you a book. This book is entitled Animals of the High Mountains. Now, we know that bighorn sheep find their homes there. They share this, they share this country with marmots and mountain lions. It's a book from National Geographic, High Mountains, animals that often get confused with bighorn sheep now that you see on the cover of this is the mountain goat. Now mountain goats have longer fur than the bighorn sheep and the males have sharp horns. And that usually not, they're curved backwards, okay, but not as much as the bighorn sheep. They're longer horns than on the females, but like I said, they don't curve around all the way like the bighorn sheep. Now, mountain goats are agile climbers, ascending steep slopes to avoid predators. 
Small herds of females raise their young while the males lead a solitary life uh, until the rutting season. Mountain goats range from the north slopes above timberline to south facing slopes at lower elevations. During the warmer months, mountain goats roam through an area of 14 square miles. These elevations form what's called an alpine habitat. Now alpine simply means high elevation. There's some overlap in the range of mountain goats and bighorn sheep, but most of the mountain goat range extends much further north through northwest Canada and into Alaska. Another alpine habitat animal is the doll sheep seen here in Denali National Park in Alaska. The doll sheep inspired a wealthy industrialist to push for the establishment of Mount McKinley National Park, now renamed Denali. The sheep were hunted to feed working crews and they were in danger of becoming extinct. The National Park was established largely to protect the doll sheep. Now while the doll sheep looks similar to bighorn sheep, it's a distinct species. While it occupies a similar eco ecological niche, its range is different from the bighorns. Doll sheep are found further north and with no overlap in range. While they require the same high cliff and alpine meadows as the bighorn sheep, they occupy a different region of North America. Doll sheep engage in similar mating behavior where they butt heads to, with the rival males to see who gets to mate with the ewes in the herd. This explosive crash is all about size. The ram with the longest horns determined by ramming head on at 20 miles an hour, gets to mate. The challenger awaits another year to try again. So we have some similar animals in mountain terrains of North America. They have a lot in common. They need the same kind of terrain to escape predation by grizzly bears, mountain lions, and wolves. The habitats they need are very similar, but they don't all live in the same place. Do they all have the same biome? Well, we'll try to answer that question when we return. Welcome to Life Passages, The Soul's Journey. I look forward to having you join us for life-changing events as they're uh, described to us by our guests and life-transforming experiences that we get to listen to and uh, maybe be kindled by in our own lives. We do our show Mondays, 9.30 p.m. It's a half hour show and Sundays, 3.30 p.m. Come join us for Life Passages, The Soul's Journey. And uh, recently, just in fact today, I did an interview with Virginia Morell, the author of the new book, Animal Wise, which has been already in its first year translated into nine different languages. It's sweeping the planet, helping us understand animals, their thoughts, their feelings, their consciousness. And then recently as well, I did an interview with Annie Williams about her work leading pilgrimages to France to sacred sites dedicated to Mary Magdalene, who along with two other Marys took refuge after the crucifixion of Christ and came to France. This is one of the cave areas where she is said to have resided. And so these are just a couple examples of the fascinating interviews that you'll encounter on Life Passages, The Soul's Journey. You can access it at rvtv.sou.edu, either live streaming at the times that it shows or on the archive. Come join us and maybe your own life will be refreshed and renewed by some of the, what you encounter on Life Passages. Be well. You're watching Ramping Up Your English, an instructional support program for intermediate level English learners. We take a content-based approach to learning English. Our content today has to do with the science concepts of habitat and biomes. Our language objective is to use connecting phrases to describe an animal's habitat and to describe a biome by listing its characteristics. This is segment two of episode 52. Our current theme is animals. Before the break, we asked a question about biomes. Well, at its simplest definition, a biome is a region and its living things. 
to distinguish a biome from a habitat, it helps to remember that a biome may contain many different habitats. Let's look at deserts as an example. A desert biome is dry with sparse vegetation and animal life. Deserts are usually very hot during the day and very cold at night. Different animals may need different aspects of the desert in order to survive. A desert tortoise needs the shade of plants during the day, as well as soil it can burrow into in order to avoid the daytime heat. It gets most of its water from the vegetation it eats. Its hard shell provides a measure of shelter from many predators. Tortoises need only a small amount of space. These elements make up the habitat of desert tortoises. A coyote also seeks out shade. However, it must move about a large area, searching out animals to eat. Coyotes must be near a source of water to drink. An adult coyote in the desert has few predators from which to escape. It needs things in its habitat that a tortoise doesn't need, and the tortoise needs some things the coyote doesn't need. They both live in the desert, but their habitats are slightly different. Now this chart by Enchanted Learning presents information about some land-based biomes. Looking at the top row, there's a description of a desert biome. Here we see some of the plants and animals commonly found in low deserts in North America. That's the desert you think of when you think of desert. They all live in the desert, but their habitat needs may be met in different ways in different areas of the desert. You can see the first animal is a bird called a roadrunner. Well, there really is such a bird, and I've seen one from a passenger train called the Sunset Limited. I've also seen the cartoon, and I'm sure you have, or maybe you have, about the roadrunner and the coyote. Well, you've seen two animals that live in the desert biome, if you've seen that, and you might feel sorry for the coyote. If you look at the third row, you'll see that it's tundra. Dry, cold, frozen soil, lichens and mosses for plants and animals that migrate, the tundra seems like a hard place for an animal to live. Well, Animals of the Tundra is a book written by Richard Vaughn, published by Celebration Press. It gives a great description of the tundra, the tundra biome, and the animals that live there. Now, those animals include the polar bear, lemming, snowy owl, musk ox, snowshoe hare, caribou, also the tundra wolf, walrus, weasel, and arctic tern. Now, if you like the cold tundra, you'll love the animals in this book, Polar Animals. It's from Flying Frog Press, designed by Jane Brett, written by Kathy Billings Leah Smith, and illustrated by Bob Bampton. And it's not just any book, it folds out. Watch this. So we have here, in the beginning, something about polar bears. And then, as we open it up, we see some information about puffins. And let's just see kind of how this book works, because that's the fun part of it. Because we have the Arctic fox that we're looking at right there. And if we flip that open, we end up with something very interesting. Because if you like flipping open a book, look at this one. This is all about, of course, this is a walrus. And, uh, and that's one of those animals. And then if you just flip that over, which is easier said than done sometimes, okay? Here's the other side of it. We see from south, uh, uh, the South Pole, we see penguins and we see seals over there. So it's a really fun book, you know, for, for flipping out and learning about the animals of the Arctic. It's called Polar Animals. So that's a book you might want to look into getting sometime. Uh, might be at a library, it might be at a bookstore. There's also lots about animals. I'll, I'll post the information about it and the ISBN on my website, letscreate.org. Now, looking at this chart, again, we see a biome in which, in, uh, in which you live. Let me, let me make sure I'm saying that right. You might see, oh yeah, you might see a biome in which you live looking at this chart if it's a different one than we've shown so far. Now, for people who live in southern Oregon, you'll see several biomes that all meet in this region, from chaparral 
coniferous forest and some temperate deciduous forest, all these converge in the Siskiyou Mountains and the valleys that span the Coast Range and the Cascade Range. That diversity in biomes is what makes Southern Oregon and Northern California such an outstanding place to visit. Nature lovers find a home here, whether for a lifetime or a couple of weeks. Now your connection to nature might be different where you live. One biome on this chart is the grassland in the United States. Now I learned this as the name prairie, and I learned about a massive prairie known as the Great Plains. Well, other parts of the world have sprawling prairies known as the steppes in some areas, savanna, and in South America, the pampas. On the Great Plains, these bulky, hooved animals once ran in huge herds. They were the main food source and the spiritual focus of a people who lived there for thousands of years. The earth shook as they ran, and they played a central role in the balance of this grassland biome. The Great Plains are largely converted to farming today, and only a tiny fraction of the tall grass and short grass prairie remain today as it was then. Now even less is the presence of the bison. A native herd still occupies the Yellowstone National Park, and at times enlightened people have returned small numbers of bison to Indian reservations, a major spiritual event for the native people there. Let's learn more about these unique American mammals in this video clip. American bison, we call them buffalo. When I was a kid, I saw a buffalo on the backside of a nickel. I didn't know then that American bison are the largest terrestrial animal in North America. The bulls weighing in at 2,000 pounds and the mature cows weighing 1,000. The calves weigh a lot less and they lack the woolly fur that keep the adults warm in winter. American bisons live in herds, forming a circle to face threats. Their curved horns can kill a predator or a threat, including a person who gets too close. Bison in the wild can live from 12 to 20 years, but there aren't many living in the wild. The herd in Yellowstone National Park get to live that way as they've lived since prehistoric times. A bison's hump is composed of muscle, enabling it to plow its head through snow. American bison were once countless on the Great Plains. They were a critical food source for Native Americans. The U.S. government practiced genocide against the Plains Indians by encouraging slaughter of the buffalo. Sadly, the policy achieved its shameful goal. Today, some bison have been returned to Native American land thanks to a change in policy and to the work of conservation groups. You're watching Ramping Up Your English. This is segment three of episode 52. Some genetically impure bison are raised for meat, uh, but the National Park Service has maintained that genetically pure herd for over 100 years. And thanks to the work of the American Bison Society, you can see bison in a number of zoos and wildlife parks. The video in the preceding clip was taken at Wildlife Safari in Winston, Oregon. Uh, they uh, are often visible also at Yellowstone National Park. A note to teachers about the sources we use in this program. The wildlife cards we so often consult are available by limited subscription. You get a few cards every month and over time you end up with eight binders like this one, this great big, this would be a tome if it was one book, okay? You end up with eight of these. And it takes two binders just like this one just to hold the cards on mammals. Another two for birds and then the other four are for other animals and features like conservation and outstanding natural places. With a set like this, you can have each student research their own animal very easily, right, with that many cards. Now these cards go by the name of Wildlife Explorer, which is a registered trademark. These are produced under license from International Masters Publishers. The biome chart I just displayed is from Enchanted Learning. Subscribers to this web-based resource gain access to a tremendous amount of resources 
for the classroom. The biome poster I used uh, is from uh, an organization called Teacher Created Materials, and the desert animal drawings are from the National Wildlife Federation. The book entitled Animals of the Tundra is part of a textbook package from the publisher Celebration Press. The Polar Animals Foldout book is from Flying Frog Publishers. The book of animals in the high country in the mountains is part of a set published by National Geographic. Contact information for all these resources will be posted on my website, letscreate.org, on the episode 52 page. Their use in this program is under the Fair Use Copyright Regulations. Whether you teach as a profession or in a different capacity, you'll find links to teaching materials used in any episode on my webpage of that episode at the same website as you saw earlier. And thank you for doing the great work you do. Thinking of work, we have a little more of that to do when we return. Organization that's doing big time restoration of forests and stream banks. Hello, I'm John Letts, producer of Adventures in Education. Welcome back to Ramping Up Your English. We're using the theme of animals as our content-based instruction to help you improve your English. This is segment three of episode 52. In our previous segment, we learned about the American bison and how they once dominated the sprawling Great Plains region of North America. This grassland biome supported tremendous herds of, bi of uh, bison in the past. Now, when we dig deeper into the bison's habitat information, we learned that there's a variation between this great grasslands biome. We also learned that there's a woodland subspecies of American bison living in the forest of Western Canada and into parts of Alaska. Looking at today's range of American bison, we see only a fraction of the area they once covered when they numbered 60 million bison. So we're out of time for today's program. So I just want to thank everyone involved in today's program uh, reminding you that you can visit my website, letscreate.org, uh, check the time for my, our programs uh, on RVTV Voices, which you can get at RVTV at, uh, and then .sou.edu. I want to thank my crew for doing such a great job and for being here for me. I want to thank my, um, my uh, director, Denise Ross, for the great job she does every time. And I want to thank you, our viewers. All of you together help make this program an award winner. Join us next time for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Join us next time on RBTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.